because the children need us. They sure do, and we need some luck as well with um, the corrupt society we have to live in. We call them corrupt because, you know, we've given them some information. Uh, they're not dealing with it. Uh, they must be corrupt or colluding with the bad people. Um, in particular, we're here again, um, and tonight's a good show because we're going to have 45 minutes of naming and shaming bad medical people um, in Belfast NHS Trust. We're with Arthur Rafferty from the Arthur Rafferty Foundation. He was um, misdiagnosed by Belfast Trust, um, and tonight we expose some of the doctors. Arthur, welcome back Hello, to the show. Andy. Yes. Thank you very much, Andy, for having me on your show. Don't yes, you go ahead and speak. Yeah, should we go, um, you know, I don't know if you, you remember the list that we talked yes. about, but um, yes. to start with the medical director, Dr. Tony Stevens. Yeah, well, he was the man in charge. He was the medical director, and he was the boss of all them doctors. He was the man that uh, went out of, out of his way to tell me no, nothing at all about my illness. But he was able to tell his own doctors, the ones under him, what to do and what not to do. It went on for 11 years there, Andy, before I got my case to court. I had a over, I had a bypass all them doctors, every one of them. And believe you me, in my eyes, I, uh, they are corrupt. And I pity people that have to go and see them because all of these doctors are still practicing in the Belfast Trust, in the main hospitals in Belfast. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pity. People has to, has to uh, see these. But if I give these the names out tonight, and the people see them, they'll be going mad. It first happened to me, Andy, in 2001, when I took sick after being a doctor for almost 30 years. I went to the mother hospital. I went to my own doctor, and he gave me a line to go up to see a specialist in the mother hospital, a fellow called Joe Kidney. Uh, I went up and spoke to Joe. He seemed okay with me. Him and me got on very, very, very well. And uh, he wanted me to do tests. I was in the hospital that morning for about six hours, maybe maybe longer. And he'd done every test known about asbestosis. And I also had scans taken by his doctor, a doctor, John Lockeran, also of the Mother Hospital. And... After the test was over, Joe, uh, Joe told me that uh, he says uh, my, my breathing is very, very heavy. And where, uh, where they work, and I told him all where he worked. I worked with asbestosis, and he says, well, Arthur, did you work with asbestosis? Uh, what kind of gear did they give you to, pro to protect you? And he said they gave me no gear at all, not even as much as a paper mask. So we left at that time. And two weeks later, he sent for me. So I went back to the mother hospital. He said, Arthur, a bad news for you. You're suffering from a sickness called asbestosis. But I didn't even know what that was, Joe. I says, uh, Andy, I says, uh, Joe, what is that? He says, did you work with a commodity called asbestos? I remember you telling me you did. Yeah. And you got no protection at all. I says, no. And we worked out ships bringing in thousands of tons of it because... The ships in the shipyard needed the asbestos for pipe lagging and heating of, of, of doors. So he says, well, they should have given us some word because that stuff was known to be deadly and a, a dangerous cargo. So he says, uh, you have to treat me here in the hospital. There's nothing we can do for you, only help you along the way. Like, that, that in itself nearly killed me when he said that, because I'm a, I'm a fit fellow. I thought myself fit. Then all of a sudden he said, there's nothing they can do for me, only help me along the way. So they, at the mother hospital, I attended that mother hospital for almost six and a half years, back and forward, getting blood tests, getting samples, my blood taken, my pressure, all, all that. And then... Uh, I, uh, he said to me, go down, see a solicitor, and claim for compensation, because the government were, are due that, after all, they brought the stuff into the country. 
Well, I done that, and uh, the quality of solicitor is filled in all necessary forms, so waiting on turn, he says, but it'll, it'll, have, it'll take a long time, Arthur, because they don't rush that asbestosis. So it was about, in the end of the sixth year, when I was running back and forward to the mother hospital, not only seeing Joe, but seeing other doctors in the hospital, young doctors. And uh, then came to me and said, Arthur, Tony Stevens out of the Belfast uh, Trust, He's a medical director. He wants you to go and see another specialist. I said, sure, why should I go and see another man when I've seen you? You're supposed to be the number one man in Northern Ireland. He says, well, uh, it's up to yourself. So I went there. I was to go to, up to the city hospital to see a fellow called Dr. Richard Shepherd. Hey, I knocked on his door, and I went. as a, a, a small man in the corner sitting at a desk, and he had a pile of papers with him, and I noticed straight away that the papers were all from the Belfast Trust. So I said, hello, I shook hands with him, I sat down. I said, now my solicitor says I have to come to see you for a complete, total examination for asbestosis. He said, no, 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 no. I said, exact words, three no's, no, no, no. He said, I I'll not have to examine you because I read your reports. And that'll do me. Now, this is me going to a doctor for a, a serious illness, a terminally Ill, illness, and he's not e even going to examine me. So I sat down, and I was reading there, sitting there, he was reading the papers. I must have spent about 20 minutes sitting there. Not a word spoke. I got a bit annoyed with him. I said, uh, doctor, my solicitor, I'll say this again, my solicitor, says I'm to come here for a thorough examination for you to find out whether I have asbestosis or not to go with two kidneys into my court case which is coming up very soon. He said, well, no, I'll not have to uh, look at it. I examine you at all. He didn't even take my, uh, my blood pressure. So I just said to him, well, doctor, I'm not sitting here all night. I'm away on. And I looked at him and he looked back at me as if I can't go anywhere. Now, I noticed a big window at the back of him. I said to myself, if I don't get out of here now, this fellow's going through that window. And I just walked straight out. Four weeks later, I got a letter from Dr. Shepard and Dr. Tony Stevens. Tony Stevens had, had said in it that, Arthur, I've good news for you. Dr. Shepard says you don't have asbestosis at all. I said to uh, Tony, how in the name of God can he say that? He never put a finger on me. This is a serious illness, and he didn't put anything near me at all. So, two or three weeks later, we were to go to court. I went up to court, and uh, I was sitting in the wee room, two lawyers came in, a fellow called Charlie Hill, and a fellow called Philip Stornham. And he said to me, Arthur, a bad news for you. You don't have any asbestosis at all. We've got word from the hospital. I said, well, who are you? I didn't even know them. He, said, he told me his name. And I said, well, uh, where is uh, the doctor's report is supposed to come through me? He hasn't told me anything. And then all of a sudden, my name was called, and I walked on out and left the two of standing there, because I didn't know them. I went into court, and the two of them charging into court after me with a pain of fails. I went up to the judge, a fellow called Paddy Coughlin. He's now Sir Paddy Coughlin, a high court judge. And I explained to him, as I explained very, very, very quick, because I'm straightforward. And he, wouldn't, he couldn't believe me. He says to me, are you joking me? I said, here they're coming there, these two here. And they, he said to him, is it true that this man does not have asbestosis? And Charlie Hill says, yes. The doctors have just found out. Just, they just found out after me attending the hospital for six and a half years. So I explained it to him, and uh, uh, the party council says, well, I'll put his case in ambience until 
he gets a proper diagnosis. And I was going to walk out, and I said, excuse me, Your Honor, these three people here, I'm sacking them now. I don't know them, but they said they're working for me. They're sacked. And I took all the papers off them. And the two of them walked out like two wee boys. And I took the papers all down, and they left the one down on the ground floor, out into my car, and spit over to the mother hospital. Normally you have to make an appointment to see Joel, Joel Kidney, but uh, I watched it and the secretary seen me, I explained the case to her, she said, and, uh, Joe, and he took me straight away. I said, Joe, what is happening here? You're treating me in this hospital for over six and a half years, and now this doctor here says, I don't have it. He says, yes, Dr. Shepard wrote to me and says that you don't have it. I said, well, how in the name of God can he say that to you, Joe? He never put a finger near me. He read things, your things. Now, your thing says, I do have it. So, where does it come from? So, he, 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 he was all shocked and surprised, Joe, because him and me got on very well over the years. And I said, well, Joe, I'm, I'm not accepting his thing. So I, I wrote to Dr. Tony Stevens again. Him and me had words, and then we had a meeting. And I went to him, we had a meeting, and I says, I'm not happy with our Joe Kidney, how he changed his mind, or who made him change his mind, and Dr. Shepard. So he says he was sending me to another doctor. This is another specialist, he says, in Aunt of Erie Hospital. Now, that morning, I was going to see her. The snow was about a, nearly a half a foot, a foot deep. And I, I didn't want to take my own car down, so I took a taxi down. And Anna went there, a girl, sat at the desk. Good morning, she shook hands. I'm Dr. Wendy Davison. No, Wendy Anderson, sorry. Wendy Anderson. So I explained who it was. I said, I, I'm down here. I have to get an examination for the sea. Two, uh, one doctor says I did have osteoporosis, then all of a sudden, Dr. Shepard says I don't have it. So she had just sat and talked to me for about 10 minutes, and there again, she had the same things that Shepard had on her desk from the Belfast Trust, Dr. Tony Stevens. I sat there for about 10, 15 minutes, nothing was happening. I said, Love, are you going to have, are you going to examine me? And she says, No, I do have to examine you. I'll be able to tell what's wrong with you from these things. So once again, uh, uh, Andy, a serious illness, they're not even going to examine me. They're going to read some papers or some things. Now, four weeks later, I got word from her. You have great news for you, Mr. Rafferty. You don't have osteoporosis at all. And I've sent word to Tony Stevens to tell him that. And on her letter and said that there's a possibility he may have some damage to his head because he was a professional boxer. What that has to, got to do with osteoporosis is beyond me. So I went straight home on the phone, on the phone of the Tony Stevens, him and me had words again. And it, it was uh, nearly two years after that of fighting him to be sent to another doctor, a doctor in England, a doctor Chris Warburton, Tree Hospital in Liverpool. Now I had to go over there, and I flew over, went to see him, and he done all the exact same things as these doctors here in Belfast done the same tests as every one was the same. After about two hours, he came back to me. He said to me, Arthur, would you like to go down for a cup of coffee? Yeah, he took me down. He said, now, I checked your things and all. He, he, first of all, he done all the tests with me. He was about nearly four hours examining me, taking my blood test, but you name it, he done it. And he says, yes, you do have osteoporosis. I said, well, Dr. Chris, will you tell me how? Three doctors in Belfast, so-called specialists, says they, do, they didn't have it. One says they did it first, but then he changed his mind, or his mind was changed for him. He says, well, I don't know. He showed me the big scan paper. He says, there's it there. You see it there. He pointed it out to me. And I came back to Belfast with his report. And also he said to me, hey, if you have any queries when you're going to court, phone me up and I fly over. 
And when I want to quote that as a that day, when I get back, the court was there, no problem. I phoned him up and he came across. He flew over for me. He was with me in the court standing, expecting them to have a wee bit of trouble. So my boss, my boss, I came, the fellow I knew, it was on my case. He said to me, Are you speaking to the other barristers? He'd be about an hour. So they wouldn't speak to me, but I, I pulled them. I said, no, there, this is not right. What about these doctors who told lies to me? I want to see every one of them in court. Because I want to ask them questions. It's how they couldn't diagnose me. And it's supposed to be asbestos spices. So he says, Arthur, no, there's no doctors coming at all. I says, well, I asked about doctors to be coming. So he says, well, there's uh, nothing I can do now. There's nothing coming. So him and the others, the, uh, the other barrister from the Belfast Trust, were talking back and forward, back and forward, for about two hours. And then they came out and they made an offer. He says they're going to settle out of court. I says, no, I'm not happy with settling out of court. I want to see them doctors in court. But and it never happened. They couldn't even face me in court. So not only did they tell lies on me, but they wouldn't face me in court. So I uh, the settled out of court. Okay, Joe, aren't they? Yeah, no, I was just letting you have your your, your speech there because if you interrupt people, you know, we don't yeah. get the flow. You've not mentioned, I don't think, John Lachlan or uh, John well, Lawson. Well, 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 what it is, Joe Kidney's uh, radiologist was John Lovern. Okay. Shepard's radiologist was John Lawson, and another doctor called Dr. Marshall, and Wendy Anderson's radiologist, she had none because she'd done nothing. And there was another doctor from the Royal Victoria Hospital, a Dr. Victor Bandare. He was uh, a radiologist. He's supposed to be the best in Britain. Now, he looked at my charts and see nothing. So it was all a big a big con mark, the whole lot, right from the word go. And that's them, six to seven doctors. So nothing for me at all. The only doctor that did anything for me was Dr. Chris. And he done the exact same tests as all those doctors done. They couldn't see it. He seen it straight away. So now, that's the difference in doctors. And plus, he flew over to Belfast in case he was wanted. A gentleman he was. And when you think of these people here, on the, the, the directing of the medical director, Tony Stevens, my God, how can they put, uh, hold their heads up high? And they're still working in the hospitals at the present day. And they not like me to, not, not like this show, because it'll, uh, it'll, uh, it will hurt them. You know, I mean, it's about time they they got off their desk and decided what's correct in this case, you know. Have I made a mistake? Okay, yes, I did. I paid compensation as a trust. Um, but, you know, it's time they stopped interfering with your life, you know, um, because, you know, you have a right to go to Liverpool for a, uh, more te- more t- treatment, more advice for your doctor, and they have um, a- an obligation to pay for it. We haven't had any um, emails back yet, but a couple of the the trust um, senior people have actually emailed me um, uh, saying that they will look into it. I know you'll probably think, well, that they may not look into it, but let's see what happens on that one. Um, right, surely, surely. Yeah, um, but they should. I mean. Everyone said that you should be getting travel fares, if nothing else. We we know they've done wrong, and sometimes when you've done wrong, you don't want your face rubbed into it. But at the same time, if it's interfering with your life or your treatment, then maybe they should need the face rubbed into it. Well, Andy, one thing that worries me is that people are coming to see these doctors day and daily. Now, the people may not have the same but courage as me to stand up to them and accept what they say and walk away. And if it's people with asbestosis, these people are 
as you said, as I talked about, they're walking dead, and they don't know they're sick. Because what these doctors done to me was diabolical, Joe. No doubt about it. And I can't understand why they picked on me. Unless it was because my father's case was going on at the same time as this. And it was all over the papers. And maybe they wanted to shut me up. Uh, as I said, Joe, this doctor in Altum Area Hospital... Uh, uh, I'll just read you a wee piece of her letter. As I explained to you in my letter of the 4th of December 2008 and reaffirmed by Dr. Anderson in the meeting, it is usual practice and normal procedure that the diagnosis is not made solely on your physical examination. Although the examination was brief, brief, it was brief, it was no examination at all. The opinion form for your diagnosis uh, included reviewing your medical notes, the reports of your X-ray, lung function tests, and blood specimens analysis. I, I am advised that Dr. Ronson also explained to you at the meeting that your CT scan provided no supporting evidence that you had developed asbestosis. So they're going to take the words of other doctors that I don't have asbestosis. And this is, this is coming from a woman. I had a trouble during the anthem, they say, in the bloody snow. And she's getting six to seven hundred pounds for seeing me. It's diabolical, Joe, you know, because th- that's what's happening in the hospital today and daily here. And the people have no, no sense of it. Uh, this is another one from the human rights. In response to your complaint that your, ra- your right to life was beat by the state, on unions. The committee concluded that no further legal action would be appropriated at this time. However, the committee is, as a result of their work, are trading on uh, agreed to keep an open watching brief on this subject. And also, secondly, suffer from examples of waves who wash people, people uh, husbands' clothes. They're more interested in waves, waves washing clothes, and they're going to keep an open brief. Like I'm, I'm dying with osteoporosis, and they're keeping an open brief on that. That's the, the that's the purpose. That's the, the choice. And now I have a story here if you want. Yes, that, that's uh, that's the day I won my case in court. Uh, it was all it was all over the Sunday world. Dying Docker wins 11-year battle over asbestos illness. Campaign Docker author Offerty claimed 50 this week an 11-year-old battle to prove he is fatally ill bestosis. For more than a, a decade, the retired deep sea Docker was battling for recognition for the, for the sacrifice of dozens of other Dockers who are of the same boat as him and worked at the Belfast docks, handling hundreds of tons of asbestos without any protesting at all. Now he, now he is dying. The seven-year-old, uh, once a 35th boxer, Matt Bodymouth boxer, has been told that he is terminally ill with asbestosis. That was in the paper after I went to court and I won my case. It's shocking after what you what well, you're reading now, and you're shocked. Why me? Why yeah, me? you? Um, why um, me? I, I've got a good guess. Um, let me think. Is what the, I was thinking, excuse me on there. What I was thinking <laughs> is because I had it all over the papers from my father's case, and I'm standing up to the British government, the RUCPSNA, the court services, and all those who wouldn't help me with my father. And I think these people are all in the same boat. After all, they're all paid by the British government and run by the British government. That's where, that's that, that's us. Uh, where I'm thinking about all day. But I uh, there again, I, I could be wrong. Well, I I think it's to do with that as well. Uh, you know, if you talk to the press and you get one over, and you even. You know, sometimes if you get compensation from either an organisation or a company, 
and they weren't happy to pay it because, you know, they didn't really want to admit any guilt. And sometimes in the future, they have done it in the past, you know, they will um, make life difficult for you. You know, why you? It's probably because of um, speaking out definitely about your dad. And why shouldn't you if someone's been murdered or, you know, medical negligence or run over in the street why wouldn't you ask questions why wouldn't you demand an inquiry why wouldn't you demand an autopsy a um one of them other things i can't remember <laughs> you know when someone's dead they um post-mortem you know what why wouldn't you do all that it's kind of normal when you're concerned about your relative or you're concerned about what's happening but what's even more important um you are being targeted mildly as an, an individual, a targeted individual mildly, because they listen into your phones, they mess about your computers, they do this and they do that. You are a targeted individual mildly. I call it mildly because, you know, you've probably not had your car run off the street, you've not had your house petrol bombed, but you know, they're just playing with your head like they do with me. Um, but, you know... We can't let that happen. I get, you know, last Saturday night, by the way, just quickly, and I'll let you carry on. We had cat litter um, thrown all over our windows and street uh, where we live, you know, and it had the the, the poo in it. Uh, um, how could that be an accident with a bin person moving the bin? That was targeted. But, it, you know, where we live, we don't know anybody. It's got to do with the radio for sure, and I'm not bothered. It's just a part of it's just a part of being British and I don't mean it in a good way, I mean it in a negative way. You just you know, we we love English, we love Christianity, we love every religion, but you know, we certainly don't like being British, even the British who live in Britain. Another thing on the I wrote to the General Medical Council in Manchester, Oxford said Manchester, and I gave them the whole story of what was happening there. And that was in uh, 2009, the 8th of March, 2009. I mentioned every one of them doctors, and nothing was ever done about them. Nothing at all. Because what they'd done was definitely wrong. It shouldn't be allowed to be done. Yeah, I mean, just to recap, in case I'm going mad, yeah. you had asbestosis, and then you didn't have it, and then finally you was given it again. You know, that. how can they make that mistake? Well, only, uh, what annoys me, they sent me the two asbestos specialists, one in the city hospital who's still working there the present day, calling himself an asbestos specialist. He never left the chair to even look at me. I had to walk out, disgusted. And then her, her and Adam, She's supposed to be a specialist too. Never examined me. How can they get away with that? And they're getting six to seven hundred pounds every visit they get. Do you think like after? Fraud. Do you think after? Um, you know, we always said, you know, why you? And maybe it is your connection with the murder of your dad. But let's put it a simple way and a, diff a really easy question. Do you think? You know, I always ask people. Do you think it's politics? Do you think it's a lack of? Um, a, B, C, and D. But in this case, do you think it's because of your religion um, is why you've been targeted and all these people have lied to you? Only as, as no doubt should be that at all. No doubt should be that at all. Because most of the people that I've been fighting with are from another religion. Not that I worry about that. But I'm not going to let anybody walk all over me. This is Ireland. I was born and reared here. And I'm going to live and die here. And these people that have been abusing me for years and years and years, from the courts, from the doctors, from the police, and the, and the, and the like, MLS, are all puzzles. I mean, it, so makes me, it makes me laugh, you know. Um, I, re, re, I don't know if you mentioned it tonight, but it made me really laugh. How can you confuse... COPD, copy disease, I call it for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. With asbestosis, that is absolutely, you've, you've got to be so bonkers. And also, I mean, if you're that good at your medicine, you couldn't even confuse copy disease with asthma. It, it is kind of similar, but, you know, if yeah. you're good at your job, 
you'd know the difference. Um, I know this because my wife just coughing a lot and bringing up phlegm, um, choking and, and all that stuff. And we thought it was copy because of, you know, like she'd been smoking for 50 years nearly. But now they said it's just asthma due to pollen and due to this and due to that. I mean, yeah. we didn't even believe them. We got a second opinion and they said it was asthma. So they're clever if they do the job right. Well, see, Andy, here's me, 100% fit fellow, never drank and never smoked, and worked hard all my life at the Belfast Stars, which kept me fit for my boxing. Now, I can barely breathe. And uh, they have a cheek to say that I didn't have osmosis. But what annoys me, two, uh, uh, two kidney, and me got on very, very, very well. He used to pull me... At night time, I, no, when, when, when I was home, are you keeping okay, Arthur? And me used to talk. Yet all of a sudden, he turned his back on me when, when he was going to court, unless he was put on the pressure by Tony Stevens and Co. And as I'm saying now, the uh, COPD, if a doctor can't tell the difference between it and asbestosis, he shouldn't be a doctor. He should be a vet. <laughs> so he should. It's unbelievable. But what these doctors have done to me, it's wrong, on the, and the people who are their bosses know it is wrong and are doing nothing about it. And the worst part about it, they'll be doing it with other people. And that's why I'm here, and that's why you're here. Exactly. Because that is more important hey. than our own stories. It's about, okay. you know... Not, I mean, they do, not being funny either. They, they do it with cancer patients. They do it with leukemia patients. And I, I do generally believe some of the time they get it wrong, which is fair enough, you know, they're only human. But just because they've got it wrong and they're only human, it doesn't mean it, it's any painful for the family or the, the patient, you know. It's it's traumatic. And I just wish to God that, you know, our prayers will get answered and you'll be able to go to Liverpool with them paying the money um, to go over there because it's a case really where we want to encourage people. It's written down in the NHS laws. If you're not happy with the doctor in your area and you live in this country called the United Kingdom of Great Britain, you're allowed to go anywhere within that district to get a second opinion. And under the travel scheme for people who are on income support and over pension age on pension credit or that kind of thing, you know. Um, um, basically, most people who are on a state benefit and in total housing benefit, you're allowed to get this travel funds, sometimes in advance as well. And it comes from the, um, I'm waiting to hear from them, the Newcastle International Branch, because although Newcastle and Belfast is still in the United Kingdom, you have to apply through the International Branch, which is a bit bizarre. Another thing on me is what annoys me is why and how these people are allowed to get away with that. Surely there must be some law that I can reach to bring these people to court, to let the public know what they've done, and ask them a question face to face as to why and who told them to do it. Because on the, it's wrong. A problem is now, um, and although I'm not trying to be funny, it may sound funny, let's put it this way, let's say that the Belfast Trust today um, or the people involved in this particular aspect of the case or even your dad's case, let's say they put their hands up, we're guilty Arthur, take me to court. Trouble is that will be justice in one way but then when you go to court you've got the corrupt judges or the judges exactly. that are they're on their side. Yeah, yeah, so they're going to walk free. They're going to walk free. That's what I'm saying. I, honey, that's what's wrong with these people. They didn't expect me to last so long and, and say them the whole way. But I told them that, that I was in for a full 15 rounds, and I think they knew what I, I, I meant. And I'm not going away until I get some for just justice and satisfaction for both my father and myself. And if I, if I get satisfaction by myself, at least I'd be helping other people who worked at the docks along with me. I'll give them a wee bit of courage to push themselves on. I can tell you um, now, if I lived in 
Northern Ireland or closer in Scotland where I could get the ferry over, we would get some banners together, would go around the airports, the train stations, and we would drum up public support. But because we're isolated and that's what they love, you know, we can't do that. But we can encourage other asbestosis sufferers to, to do that the same, you know, um, and, and that may be another angle that I haven't thought of. You know, at the we're, moment, only, we're not isolated. We're only half an hour away. I could get a plane to Edinburgh in the morning, and I'm fit enough to go and protest because I protest here in Belfast at Stormont, at the King's Hall, at doctor's surgeries, you name it, and it hasn't cost me a thought. Actually, and, um, thinking about it, where I live, uh, we have a brilliant community in Scotland. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm not in Edinburgh, but we have direct flights from Belfast International with EasyJet to Inverness. Yeah. And I'm only like an hour or two away, and we could do an Inverness protest based on, and this, and I never, you keep giving me ideas now, um, if you could get the flight over, you know, we could, um, I could show you somewhere cheap to stay, um, or you could come up to our place, which is a couple of hours from Inverness, it's only a little bit of petrol, but recently the doctors in the Highland region, in the Highland hospitals, Ragmore, they've been bullied um, big time. It's been in the news, and the doctors are, are even going in protest. But it's because they've been working hard and they're not getting paid enough, and sometimes they're misdiagnosing people, and sometimes... Yeah. They're bullied into um, leaving people suffering with other problems, and I think that that would be a good news story for Scottish television uh, to show the difference between what's happened to you, which is linking a little bit to what's happening in the Highland region. And you know, I'm not saying that your doctors were were bullied. Who knows? They may have been, but it's not news in. Northern Ireland, it's news in Inverness at the moment, and they still haven't, you know, the, the doctors, I think there's 400 of them wrote to the trust and said, look, I'm being bullied, um, I've got to do this and got to do that, and it's caused thousands of patients having a problem. It's not s still been resolved. Um, so the news would love that if you came to Inverness for a protest, and I could gather up at least half a dozen people. Well, only you do that, and I'll be there. I'll not let you down. And believe you me, I have spoke to big meetings here in Belfast with doctors there involved, and police involved, and they didn't like it. Because I pulled no punches with them. I had no fear of them at all. Because what they've done to me was wrong. And then what they've done to my peer father was wrong also. And they're getting away with it. As you say, it's no good uh, having protesters here with these corrupt courts here. They're, they're as corrupt as sin, so they are. Well, I, 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 w I will um, also make sure, I mean, I said five or six people. That's just the people I know. I would make sure, though, that anybody that I've ever known in Scotland, and I've got a few thousand of them, I've only been up here six years, um, but I'd make sure that they all know about the protest, um, all the medical support. You know, we'd have to plan it for a certain day. Um, obviously, the later, the better, because it's it too short, it doesn't work. Because people have got no chance to come. Um, I'm just trying to think what we know, April, May. I'd say sometime in June, just before I go on holiday. Uh, uh, where do you go? If you organise it, but no problem, I'll not let you down. I'll be there. And believe you me, if you want me to speak, I'll speak. One thing, I'd, I, uh, I'll i speak loud and clear to you. I'll let the people know what, it, what it's like to, be, to live in Belfast. The whole town is corrupt. No doubt about it. But not only that, the NHS has got problems. We can't always point the finger to a town, a city, a country, a religion. It, you know, the actual service that we're getting from government, the medical services, is also, um, you know, it's falling apart. And we need people. We've had cancer people recently do the same. Why not asbestosis people? Why not get Absolutely. them up from, from England, you know? Um, I mean, in fact, we could find a campaign banner, you know, uh, clear your lungs, come to the Highlands and 
have a day of protesting, you know, something like that. I don't know. It's, yeah. I'm just talking off the top of my head here. Um, yeah. If we do it late June before I go off on holiday and then at least I can jump out the protest wagon into the airplane so no one can get me. <laughs> a quick getaway. <laughs> In, oh, fact, well, you, in uh, fact, I know what will work. What will work? You do that. You do that. Yep. Uh, at least it may help people who have asbestosis and don't know what to do. Yeah, it's only about eighty quid, um, maybe a hundred maximum, the easy jet from international. I'm not worried about that. Only, yeah. I'm not worried about the fur. If I can do that to abuse these people and abuse this government for what they've done to me and hundreds of other people, it'll be worth every penny. Well, eight or nine weeks from today. We'll have that protest in Well, you do that. You make arrangements. And you want me to make a couple of banners here in Belfast? I make them. I prefer you make the banners because you know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'll get, right. I'll get, I'll get the people in the media. Yeah, because that banners made here and all because when I was out, they protest. The pictures and all in it. Because at least uh, let the public know what's going on behind closed doors there. No, absolutely. Not. But, um, I tell you what, if anybody wants to, um, um, you know, join us on this protest at the end of June, I've got a perfect date in mind. Um, I can't remember it at the moment. It's the end, end of June, the last Friday in June. Um, the reason being, I'm 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 in Inverness for three days, and we yeah. can, you know, we can. You know, I live 120 miles north of that, but if yeah. I'm in Inverness for three days, you know, it will be perfect to, um, you, you know, talk to you as well. Uh, yeah, in fact, it might might be best um, first of July. The reason being, I always think the seventh month is a lucky month. Right. Uh, um. If you're a spiritual person and you're into numerology, um, the first of the, the the lucky sevens is a good month. Yeah, let's call it from now, 1st of July, email Andy at freedomtalkradio.co.uk if you want to take part. Um, I'll talk to you in a minute after, and thanks for coming on the show. We've got 20 seconds left. Um, don't forget to go to YouTube station um, channel Alpha Rafferty, yeah. Google Alpha Rafferty Senior and Alpha Rafferty YouTube. Um, the Scappa teacher, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, To St George's Hill A ragged band they called The diggers came to show The people's will They defied the landlords They defied the laws They were the dispossessed Reclaiming what was theirs We come in peace they said To dig and sow We come to work the lands in common And to make the waste grounds grow This earth divided We will make whole so it will be a common treasury for all The sin of property we do this day No man has any right to buy and sell the earth for private gain By theft and murder they took the land Now everywhere the walls spring up at their command They make the laws to chain us well the clergy dazzle us with heaven or they damn us into hell We will not worship the God they serve The God of greed who feeds the rich while poor men starve We work, we eat together, we need no swords We will not bow to the masters or pay rent To the Lord we are free men Though we are poor You diggers all stand up for glory Stand up now